Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Call, and I'm the events advisor at Politics and Prose Bookstore. Whether you're here with us in person or watching virtually from home, on behalf of Politics and Prose and Sixth and I, we want to thank you for being with us tonight and for supporting an independent bookstore and a nonprofit. And now it is my honor to welcome David Brooks back to Sixth and I, where we have hosted him for two of his previous novels. I mean, titles, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. I've been reading David's work since picking up a copy of his first book some 20 years ago, the very funny, spot-on Bobos in Paradise, which in its description of bourgeois bohemian values, the Bobos of the title, cut uncomfortably and sometimes hilariously close to the bone. His often provocative weekly columns in the New York Times do a similar job of taking on and deconstructing subjects ranging from events in the Middle East to Trumpism, to artificial intelligence, to what he calls the soft and squishy stuff, including baseball, music, and sociology. And whether you agree with his analysis or not is often beside the point because he inevitably makes you see issues in a new light. Tonight he's here to talk about his new book, How to Know a Person, a guide to fostering deeper connections at home, at work, and throughout our lives, which I've heard him describe as part of his own four-year journey to becoming a fuller human being, to doubling down on being a defiant humanist. As with his columns, his analysis draws on an eclectic mix of fields. Kirkus has called this a hands-on guide for making meaningful human connections, and USA Today suggests this book is for anyone searching for connection and yearning to be understood. Before I turn the mic over to David, just a few notes. Later in the program, we'd love to hear your questions, and you'll be invited to line up at the standing microphones on either side of the aisle. Following the event, there'll be a book signing if you'd like your name added to your book, and there are also additional autograph books in the sa for sale in the main lobby. Thank you all again, both here and at home, for being with us tonight, and please join me in giving a warm welcome to David Brooks. Thank you, Susan. First of all, let's hear it from politics and prose. Uh, a beloved institution where I've spent many thousands of dollars. <laughs> and let's hear it for Sixth and I. I um, this place um, was a synagogue, and then it became a church, and then it was going to be sold and become a nightclub, uh, which I would have gone to, of course. <laughs> But a uh, few uh, people bought it and wanted to turn it into a synagogue. And the first uh, Jewish uh, service in this spot in 50 years was my son's bar mitzvah. And, and uh, the, later my daughter had her bat mitzvah here. So it's always meaningful to be on this spot. And as someone who sat here through those two services thinking, don't screw it up, don't screw it up. I hope I don't screw it up, and I honor the, the, the performances they did. Uh, so many of you may have seen this movie years ago called Fiddler on the Roof. And if you saw that movie, you know how warm and fuzzy Jewish families can be, always singing and dancing. I come from the other kind of Jewish family. And so in our culture, the phrase was, think Yiddish, act British. <laughs> and so we were stiff upper lip, unemotional. Uh, and uh, in, when I was four, my parents, took me, my parents told me that the nursery school teacher pulled them aside and said, you know, David doesn't really play with the other kids. He just watches them. <laughs> uh, and that was served me well as a career as a journalist, because I tell journalism students, if you're at a football game and everybody else is doing the wave and you don't do the wave, you just sit there, you have the right kind of aloof personality style to become a journalist, because <laughs> we just watch things. Uh, and then, so I was sort of set apart, sort of living in my head, even from an early age. And then when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, 
And I decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. And I've been writing pretty much every day since. I write from 7 to 12. And when I was wearing a Fitbit, it would tell me I was napping in those hours. <laughs> but really, I was just doing what God meant me to do, so I guess my heart rate came down. And then when I was 17, I, I was writing and dreaming of being a novelist. And thank you for celebrating me as a novelist. <laughs> Only my columns are novels, but the books are nonfiction. Um, and so I wanted to date this woman in high school named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date somebody, somebody else. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> and so that's where my values were. Uh, so I was up in my head even at 17. And then when I was 18, the, Columbia, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Um, and so I went, and the famous phrase about Chicago is it's where fun goes to die. That's the famous thing that people say about it. My favorite thing about Chicago is it's, the favorite saying is it's where a back to school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> and so, uh, and I fit right in at Chicago. I had a double major in history and celibacy while I was there. Um, and so, again, living up in my head a little. And my freshman roommate and I, we, um, we entered the Golden Gloves boxing competition. Uh, and we, we gave him a nickname, the Kosher Killer. Uh, and then we trained the Chicago way. We didn't actually practice boxing, we just read a lot of books about boxing. <laughs> and so his illustrious career lasted 29 seconds. Um, and so I was living up in my head and wasn't really living uh, down here in the heart. And that was good for journalism. And I remember thinking when I was in college, like I looked at all these deep people and they were all so sad. And I was like, I'm shallow, I'm fine. I don't feel bad stuff, I don't feel anything, I'm fine. Um, and so then I went off and started a career in journalism and I became a conservative columnist at the New York Times, a job I likened to being the chief rabbi at Mecca, because uh, it was kind of lonely there. And, and then I got a job on TV. But even for TV, my job was a little cerebral. The PBS NewsHour is pretty much the intellectual version of TV. Uh, and uh, we have a great audience, they're very serious, they love their issues, they're, they're a little seasoned. Um, and so if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's gonna say. Um, I don't watch your program, but my mother loves it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and so that's our crowd, we're, we're very big in the hospice community. Um, <laughs> And so that's three, we're like a little removed from emotional life. And so I had fallen into one way of life. And when I think about it, it's epitomized by an event that happened maybe 12 or 13 years ago. I'm a big baseball fan, I've been to thousands of baseball games, and I've never caught a foul ball. And so I take my youngest son to Baltimore, to Camden Yards, and we're sitting there, and a batter loses control of his bat. And the bat flies up in the air, into the stands and lands at my feet. Now getting a bat is a thousand times better than getting a ball. <laughs> and so any normal human being is raising his trophy in the air and high-fiving everybody, hugging everybody, getting on the jumbotron. And I take the bat, put it at my feet, and I stare straight ahead with no emotion. <laughs> and I look back on that guy and I think, show a little joy, man. But I was a little, estranged from my emotions. And so things happen in life. Parenting is an emotional revolution. I had the normal things that happen to everybody, which is a, some set of um, public humiliations and things that sort of tender you up. Uh, and so I, I think I got a little more emotional. Uh, and it became a bit of a goal for me to, be, to become a more full human being. And so I tried to do that the Chicago way. I wrote a book about emotion called The Social, An Social Animal, which is what Chicago would do. You read a book about it. Then I wrote a book about character called The Road to Character. And I realized that writing a book about character doesn't give you good character. And even reading a book about good character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. 
So, um, and so I got a little more human and more emotional. Uh, and I discovered on getting on discovering my heart that surprisingly, even though at the time I was like 55, I had the heart of a 14-year-old girl. And so every Taylor Swift breakup song I was in love with. And so I can't even remember high school, but I remember every time Taylor Swift had her heart broken. And so I'm listening to all these 50 Cent songs, Katy Perry, Kesha. I, my heart was reincarnated, but it was reincarnated as Britney Spears. Um, and, but I, I got a little more emotionally open. And I can prove it to you, but I have to do a little name dropping. So I was, I've been interviewed twice in my life by Oprah. First in 2014 and then in 2019. And after the second interview, she said to me, David, you've changed so much. I've never seen anybody who was so emotionally blocked before. And that was a good moment for me because it was shown some emotional progress that I've become a more human being. And she should know, she's Oprah, right? Uh, and so that was a good moment. And the odd thing for me was that as I was approaching becoming a more human being, American society was getting more dehumanized. And so we all know the statistics, the high rate of depression, a 30% increase in suicide, much higher for teenagers, 36% of Americans feeling lonely and depressed most of the time, 45% of teenagers feeling despondent and hopeless consistently, the percentage of Americans who say they have no close friends has increased fourfold since 2000. And so these are just grim social statistics that suggest some form of social, emotional, and I think spiritual breakdown. And as my job as a journalist, I found an epidemic of invisibility. And so my job is to travel around the country interviewing people. And I interview people who feel invisible and unseen. And these are blacks who feel their daily injustices are not experienced by whites, rural people not being seen by coastal elites, Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. These are husband and wives who realize the person who should know them best has no clue, and teenagers who feel that no one knows them well. Now, human beings need recognition as much as they need anything else. There's nothing crueler than to say, I don't see you, you don't exist, you're invisible. And Ralph Ellison's fabulous novel, The Invisible Man, starts out with a phrase, a, a section on how people don't see me. They see their imagination, they see the world around me, and they don't, but they don't see me. And he says in this, that very profound first passage, when people treat me that way, I wanna lash out at them. I wanna punch them just to show that I exist. And he says it never works out well. But that's what's happened with American society, that sadness leads to meanness. When people feel unseen, they regard it as an injustice, which it is, and then they want to lash out. And so I've quoted a bunch of sadness statistics, but I could quote a bunch of meanness statistics, hate crimes, gun violence. It used to be two-thirds of Americans gave to charity, now it's less than 50%. Uh, and so loneliness, loneliness leads to dehumanization. And so we're in some sort of moment of mass social crisis. And so why is it happening? And I could tell you a bunch of stories about that. There's the technology story, social media is making us all crazy. There's the sociology story, we're not as active in civic and community organizations as we used to be. I could tell you an economic story, there's widening inequality so we don't have the same kind of lives as we used to. Uh, and I agree to a degree with all those stories, but the story I tell is the most direct, which is that we don't treat each other with the kindness and consideration and respect we deserve. And that's partly because we're distrustful, we're afraid, we're enwrapped in a culture of bitterness and dispute. But it's partly, I think, because we just don't have the skills that people don't have the skills of how to treat each other in the complex cir circumstances of life. How do you be a good listener? How do you end conversations gracefully? How do you reveal vulnerability in an appropriate place? 
How do you sit with someone who's suffering? How do you ask for and offer forgiveness? How do you break up with someone without crushing their heart? These are skills. They're skills that can be taught as much as, liter as, much as carpentry can be taught, as much as law can be taught, as much as tennis can be taught. And a lot of us are just not as good as we should be, including me, at these skills. And there's one skill that's the apex skill, the skill that's at the center of every healthy family, organization, and community. And that's the ability to make other people feel seen, heard, and understood, and make them feel respected. So I ask you guys, how good are you at these skills? And I've met some of you, but I haven't met a lot of you. But I can say with a high degree of confidence, you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> There's a guy named Will William Ickes at the University of Texas who studies this. And he finds that when strangers meet each other for the first time, they understand each other accurately only 20% of the time. With friends and family, it's 35% of the time. There are some people who are really good. They're 55% of the time. They get the other people. Some people are terrible at it. They're 0% of the time and they think they're 100% of the time. <laughs> and so in any group of people, I've found there are diminishers and there are illuminators. And the diminishers make people feel small and unseen. They stereotype, they label, they're so into themselves they're just not curious about other people. They don't ask questions. And I found I go to, to um, dinner parties, especially here in DC, the most emotionally avoidant place on the face of the earth. <laughs> uh, and I leave the dinner party thinking, you know, that whole time nobody asked me a question. And I've come to believe that in, maybe it's my DC bias, but maybe it's the whole country, that maybe 30% of the people in the country are question askers. And the rest are perfectly nice people, they just don't ask questions. They are on broadcast mode. And I, I was interviewing a guy at the White House mm, during the Obama administration, and we, he was talking to me about something, and we were on, I was on my cell phone, and the call dropped. So I thought, oh, he's going to notice the call drops. He'll call me back. <laughs> so th three minutes go by, four minutes, five minutes go by, seven minutes go by. Finally, at 10 minutes, I call his office. I talk to his assistant, and I say, can I talk to this person? And she says, no, he, he, he can't talk to you, he's on the phone. <laughs> I'm like, no, he's on the phone with me. <laughs> he's just been bloviating. He doesn't realize his call has dropped. <laughs> and so that's diminisher behavior. <laughs> Some people are illuminators. They make you feel lit up, seen, and respected. And so there was a novelist who, an English novelist, who wrote slightly over a century ago named E.M. Foster. Uh, and his biographer wrote of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity, you had to be your most honest, sharpest, and best self. It would be great to be that guy, to bring out the best in each person you encountered. There's a story uh, about a woman named Jenny Jerome, a maybe apocryphal story, but it's too good not to tell. Uh, and she later would become Winston Churchill's mother. But she, when she was a young woman in late 19th century England, one night she was seated next to uh, William Gladstone, the Prime Minister of England. And she left that dinner thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. And then a couple weeks later, she was seated next to at another dinner, uh, Gladstone's great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she left that dinner thinking that she was the most cleverest person in England. <laughs> so it's good to be Gladstone, it's better to be Disraeli. There's, there's a famous lab, a research lab called Bell Labs. Uh, and some of the people at Bell Labs realized that some of their researchers were way more innovative than some of the others. And they wanted to know why. So they looked at their education backgrounds, they looked at their IQ, they couldn't figure it out. But the most innovative researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with a, an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Nyquist, would get inside their head, would ask them questions, and really would accompany them through the process of thinking through their challenges. And he would help them be, solve their problems. So Harry Nyquist was an illuminator. He knew how to get inside other people's heads. 
So how does one get better? We don't want to be diminishers, we want to be illuminators. How do you get better? Well, the first thing I would tell undergrads is, well, major in the humanities and the liberal arts. <laughs> um, um, because they are the fields that teach you about other people. And if you can't understand other people, you're going to be miserable, and you'll make your life make uh, people around you miserable. So learn how other people operate. As we get older, we, we're not going to major in the humanities, but we can go to politics and prose and buy books of novels. Um, and so that's just a way of um, understanding how people operate. The second thing is to proceed through the process of transforming a person who's a stranger into a friend. There's a process of getting to know other people. And the first stage in that process is just that first encounter, that first meeting. And it's the gaze. When you meet someone, you cast a quality of attention upon them. And that quality of attention you cast is just so important. Because when you meet someone, they're unconsciously asking themselves the following questions. Am I a priority to this person? Am I a person to this person? Or am I just an object to this person? And the answers to those questions are communicated with your eyes before any words come out of your mouth. So I was in Waco, Texas uh, a couple years ago, and I'm sitting with a woman named LaRue Dorsey, who's this 93-year-old lady, and she'd been a school teacher most of her life. And at, dinner, at breakfast, she communicated herself to me as this strict, stern, drill sergeant person. She was tough and intimidating to me. She told me I loved my students enough to discipline them. And I was a little, wow, taken aback by this tough lady. And so a mutual friend of ours comes into the diner and he, he sees us there. His name is Jimmy Durrell. He's a pastor and he pastors the homeless. And he comes up to us and he comes up to the table and he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders and he shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. And he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best, you're the best, I love you, I love you. And that stern disciplinarian that I had talked to turned into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And I thought, wow, that's the power of attention. He called forth a ver different version of her than I was calling forth. And some of it just because Jimmy is a warm person. But some of it is because Jimmy's a pastor. And so when Jimmy meets somebody, any person he meets, he meets somebody made in the image of God. When he meets somebody, he's looking into that face and he sees the face of God. He sees a face and a soul of infinite value and dignity. And he sees somebody so important that Jesus was willing to die for that person. Now you could be a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or an agnostic or an atheist, but seeing people with that level of reverence and respect is an absolute precondition for seeing them well. Because every person we meet is not a problem to be solved. They're a mystery that we will never get to the bottom of. Every person we meet is smarter than us on some subject, more interesting on some subject. And so you have to approach them with a level of reverence and respect. Now the second phase of getting to know someone, that first stage is just that first encounter. The second phase is, is what I call accompaniment. And accompaniment is an other-centered way of being with people. And think about the way a pianist accompanies a singer. He's paying attention or his job is to make her shine. And so it's an other-centered way through normal life. And so it's, you're picking up your kids at school, you're at a meeting at work, you're just hanging around with people. Accompaniment is other-centered. And sometimes it's just like being patient with other people. I have this problem in my life. I have this terrible productivity mindset. So if I pull into a gas station, uh, I think, oh, I've got 90 seconds here. I can get two emails done. <laughs> and that's just a terrible mentality. Because if you go with that efficiency mindset, you're not going to have time to develop a relationship. But I have a couple who live with me on Capitol Hill, and they say, um, 
We like our friends to be lingerable. <laughs> we want them to be the sort of people, that they come over for dinner, they just linger. And that's the way you get to know somebody, you're patient with them. You're gonna let the relationship develop. The second part of accompaniment of just this process of early getting to know someone is play. When you're playing, playing is not an activity, playing is a mindset. When you're playing, you're like natural, you're yourself. Uh, so I love playing basketball. And if you look at me, you can imagine how bad my game is. <laughs> uh, but when you're playing basketball, you're, you're trash talking, you're high-fiving, you're passing the ball. And I'm a very unselfish basketball player. My strategy is a five six, foot six guy who can't, who's slow and can't jump or shoot, uh, is that I drive in a lane, all the six foot five guys, they're, they start looking like wolves as I drive in a lane. So I come at them and I pass the ball out. So I surrender effectively. That's my basketball game. But I, the game I play with my friends, we may have no conversations that have profundity, but we know each other because we're just being ourselves with each other. And you can play basketball with a group of people and you would die for them, even though you don't really know too much about them aside from how they play basketball. When my oldest son, the son who had the bar mitzvah here, was about 12 or 14 months, we were living in Brussels, and he woke up at four in the morning, God bless him, uh, and I, I would play with him from four to 10 when I went off to work. And I remember thinking when he was like 12 or 14 months, I know him better than I've known anybody because we've been so natural with each other during play. And he knows me better than anybody has ever known me. And we've never exchanged a word because he couldn't talk yet. And so that's the power of play even before um, words come into the picture. And so another part of presence is first is just that lingerability and second is just being playful. But finally, is the art of presence. It's the art of just being there for people at the right time. And again, this is, can be early in a relationship. I had a student named Jillian Sawyer, what I was teaching at Yale, because I only teach at schools I couldn't have gotten into. Um, <laughs> and Jillian was in my class, and she was a graduate student. And in college, um, her dad had died of pancreatic cancer. And as he was dying, he, they would talk about how the, the fact that he was going to miss a lot of the important events of her life, like her wedding. And after graduation, she was a, a bridesmaid at a friend's wedding. And she watched the dad give, at that wedding, give his daughter a beautiful toast. And then it came time for the father-daughter dance at the reception. And she decided she was going to skip this one. So she left the table and went off to the ladies' room for a cry. And when she got out, she noticed that all the people in her table and the adjoining table had left their tables and come to hang out outside the ladies' room. And they were just going to be there for her. And she gave me permission to quote from the paper she wrote describing that moment. What I will remember forever is that no one said a word. Each person, including new, newer boyfriends who I knew less well, gave me a reaffirming hug and headed back to their table. No one lingered or awkwardly tried to validate my grief. They were there for me, just for a moment, and it was all that I needed. It's just a beautiful moment of presence. It's just how we can be present for one another. So that's the second stage of getting to know another human being. The third stage is having a conversation, is being really good at conversation. Now, how good are you at conversation? My estimation is you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> a person, any person you meet, is a point of view. Any person you meet is a creative artist who's taken the events of their life and turned it into a unique way of seeing the world. Aldous Huxley said, experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. And so when we're trying to know another person, we want to know their subjective way of looking at the world. And if I want to see you, I want to see how you know the world. 
Uh, and so you want to be, you want, just want to have a conversation, you want to ask people, how do you look at this? And so for the book, I talked to a bunch of conversation experts. I asked them, how can I be better at conversation? And they gave me some tips, and I'm going to share a few of them with you. One of them is treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. If you're talking to someone, make it 100% or 0%, don't make it 60%. Give them total attention. Another one is be a loud listener. I have a friend, a guy named Andy Crouch. When you talk to him, it's like talking to one of those Pentecostal churches. He's like, he's like loud. He's like, yes, I agree, yes, amen, preach, yes, yes. <laughs> Love talking to that guy. <laughs> Make them authors, not witnesses. When people are telling you stories, they don't go into enough detail. So if you say, well, where was your boss sitting when she said that to you? Suddenly they're narrating a story to you, and suddenly it's a richer version of what they have to say. As a journalist, I no longer ask people, what do you believe about this? I ask people, how did you come to believe this? And suddenly they're telling me about an experience they had that formed their opinions, or they're telling me about somebody in their life who shaped their values. It's just a much better conversation. Don't fear the pause. If we're having a conversation and my comment to you starts at my shoulder and ends at my fingertips, at what point have you stopped listening so you can think of what you're going to say? Probably here. Let me talk to my end of my fingertips and then hold up your hand and pause for three or four seconds as you think of what you're going to say. It's very honoring. Don't fear the pause. Don't be a topper. If you tell me about the problem you're having with your teenage son, and then I say, oh, I get exactly what you're dealing with. I'm having a problem with my Tommy. It sounds like I'm trying to relate to you, but what I'm really doing is saying, I'm really not interested in your problem. Let me talk about mine. So don't be a topper. A couple more. Keep the gem statement in the center. If you're in a fight with someone and you disagree, there's probably something deep down that you agree upon. If my brother and I are debating about our dad's health care, we may disagree about that, but we want what's best for our dad. And so if we can keep that agreement, that thing we agree upon, the gem statement in the center, we save our relationship amidst a disagreement. And the final one is find the disagreement under the disagreement. If we disagree about tax policy, or if we disagree about the Middle East, there's probably philosophical reasons we see things fundamentally differently. Instead of just fighting with each other, let's find out what the deep reason is we disagree. And then we come to understand each other a little better. And so these are little tips to be just a better conversationalist. They're skills. But the ultimate skill of being a good conversationalist is question asking. The, ability, the quality of your conversations depends on the quality of your questions. And kids are phenomenal at asking questions. So I have a friend in New York named Naomi Wei, and she teaches seventh grade boys on how to be interviewers, how to ask questions. And so she, one day, the first time she did this, she said, okay, you boys are gonna ask me a bunch of questions and I'll give you a truthful answer. And so the first question a boy asked was, are you married? She said, no. Second question from another boy was, are you divorced? She said, yes. Third question from another boy is, do you still love him? She was like, whoa. <laughs> she said that it would be answered, so she said yes. Fourth question, does he know? Fifth question, do your kids know? By this time, she's crying. <laughs> and so kids are just phenomenal question answers. But we lose that ability as adults because we don't want to seem invasive and we don't want to seem dumb. So we're not as good at asking questions as kids are. And so what you want to learn is you want to ask humble questions that are open-ended. Tell me about a time. Tell me about a time. And so there's a focus group. I, I read about this in a book called You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy. And uh, she describes a, a um, focus group mediator who was hired by grocery stores to find out why people go to the grocery store late at night. And she could have asked the focus group, why do you go to the grocery store late at night? But because she's a good question asker, she asked, tell me about the last time you went to the grocery store late at night. And so there's a woman in the focus group who hadn't said anything yet, 
who said, well, I'd smoked a joint, and I wanted a menage a trois with me, Ben, and Jerry. <laughs> and so by asking an open question, she got a little glimpse into this lady's life. And so that's a good question. And as you're getting to know someone, you can ask more and more intimate questions. I start off conversations by asking people about their childhood. People love to talk about their childhood. And you just learn a lot. I asked a friend of mine who's this profound academic, what's your favorite unimportant thing about you? And I learned this big philosopher watches more trashy reality TV than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> then as you get to know people, you can ask them profounder questions. And my favorite kind of questions are the ones that lift you 30,000 feet above yourself so you see your life from a different perspective. And these are questions like, if the next five years are a chapter in your life, what's the chapter about? I guess people are thinking, okay, where am I in my life? What crossroads are you at? We're often at a moment of transition in our life, but this question says, okay, what transition am I at? If you died tonight, what would you regret, what would you regret not doing? Can you be yourself where you are and still fit in? I have a friend named Peter Block who writes about community. He has great questions. What is the no or refusal you keep postponing? What commitments have you made that you no longer believe in? What gift do you currently hold in exile? What talent do you have that you're not using? And my wife and I, who I think is here somewhere in the room, uh, I asked a question at a dinner party that sounds a little pretentious, but it turned into a great conversation, which is how do your ancestors show up in your life? And so we had a Dutch couple, and they talked about their Dutch heritage. We had a black couple at the dinner, and they talked about African-American heritage. I talked about my Jewish heritage. And so we're, we're like all shaped by this history that comes before us. And it was just fun to hear everybody reflect on how they were shaped by that history. And we had a significant conversation, what could have been an unmemorable night. And those little moments are part of seeing others and being deeply seen. So, so far I've described how do you get to know somebody in normal circumstances of life, in normal times? And how do you breach over the barriers that separate one human being from another? We happen to live right now in harder times than that, in times of political disagreement, in times of disunity, in times of sadness, and in times of meanness. And so I'll just do a couple, now we're getting to the advanced phase of getting to know the, another human being. And one of those skills, the advanced skills, we're now in graduate school here. The advanced skills are first, how do you sit with someone who's suffering? And so I told this story in the New York Times several months ago, I tell it in the book. My oldest friend in life was a guy named Peter Marks. And he was here at the bar mitzvahs at six and I. Uh, and we met at age 11 at a summer camp. Uh, and he had a gorgeous life in many ways. He had a successful career as a surgeon, my surgeon. He had a wonderful wife, two wonderful boys. Uh, and we built our friendship on play. We played basketball, we played tennis. We could turn anything into play. And my wife said he is the rare combination of the extraordinary and the ordinary. He was a man the way you're supposed to be a man, which is strong but also vulnerable. He was a father the way you're supposed to be a vulnerable, uh, which is leading his sons, but so proud and so playful. And then at age 57, he suddenly got hit by a severe depression. Uh, and I have to confess at that moment, I didn't really know what depression was. I thought I did, but I didn't really know. And William Styron wrote a beautiful book called Darkness Visible about his own depression. He wrote, the madness of depression is generally speaking the antithesis of violence. It is a storm, a storm of murk. Soon evident are the slowed down responses near paralysis, psychic energy throttled back to close to zero. I experienced a curious inner convulsion that I can only describe as, despair, as the despair beyond despair. I did not think such anguish was possible. And that's what Pete was going through. Another friend of mine, a guy named Michael Gerson, who I hope some of you know from the Washington Post column that he had, uh, described depression 
as a malfunction of the instrument we use to determine reality. And that's what Pete had. He had lying voices in his head that told him things like, you're useless, you're not worthy, nobody would miss you if you were gone. And so he had to deal with those lying to voices. And I've emphasized these social skills of getting to know another person. And a couple of years ago when Pete was going through depression, I was insufficiently skilled at, dealing, at sitting with someone who was going through this. And so I told him a group, a, a bunch of things that were foolish. The first thing I did was to try to give him ideas of activities that would lift him out of depression. I used to say, you used to go on these service trips to Vietnam, you should do that again, that'll cheer you up. And I later learned that telling somebody, giving somebody ideas about how to get out of depression is a sure sign of telling them you don't get it. Because it's not ideas they're lacking, it's energy and motivation and many other things. The second mistake I made was I tried to do what they call positive reframing. I tried to remind him of all the things that were great in his life, his career, his marriage, his family. But I learned that t telling someone that, you're only telling them, you're only reminding them that they're not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable. And so you're making them feel worse. And so I learned very gradually that a friend's job in these circumstances is not to cheer the person up. It's to acknowledge the reality of the situation, this sucks. And to say, I'm just gonna be here with you and I'm not going away. And so after a while I tried to be just normal and to acknowledge the fact there was nothing that I could say that would make it better. It was just being present was the only thing I could do. I wish I had bombarded Pete with more like texts and quick touches just every other day saying, just thinking about you, no response necessary. I wish I had told him, I want more for you. I can't do anything about it, but I want more for you. I wish I had said I admired him for enduring. The fact that he was still alive was a sign of courage because he was enduring so much pain and he wasn't giving up. And that was an act of amazing courage. Viktor Frankl, when he confronted people who were contemplating suicide in the death camps in the Holocaust, he would say to them, life has not stopped expecting things of you. And he would emphasize to them that people who have suffered have a certain credibility they carry in the world that can deal with others who are in suffering. There's a great quote from Thornton Wilder, without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble in the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children of the earth as can one human being broken on the wheels of living in love's service only the wounded soldiers can serve. And that's a tribute and an honor to those who have suffered of how they can bring their suffering to bear with credibility on others who are suffering. And in our culture today, um, so many families are dealing with this. And to being skilled in the art of dealing with those with mental health and depression issues is just part of showing up for people these days. And Pete lost his battle with depression. He succumbed to suicide in April 2022. And it was a hard education, but it was part of the process we all have to go through to learn how to be um, more human to each other. Now that's one hard conversation that a lot of us have to sit with and, and try to be good at in these times. Another is hard conversations across disagreement, across an ideological disagreement, across economic difference, across racial difference. These are sometimes hard conversations and I have these conversations all the time. I travel around the country, I go to two or three states a week and I talk to people and some are further right than me and some are further left than me. But they look at me and they see New York Times, Atlantic Magazine, PBS, Yale. I come with a lot of elite baggage. I know a lot of things and the one thing I'm an expert at is how to survive in progressive elite institutions. Like that's, <laughs> um, and so they come at with me with critique because they think I'm part of systems that hold them down. 
And I think a lot of us, you could be an administrator at a school and students are coming at you with critique. You could be a boss at a company, people are coming at you with a critique. There's just a lot of that. And so my initial reaction in those conversations is to, to be defensive. Say, wait, I'm one of the good guys. You, understand, you have to understand what I'm going through. But I've learned my first job in these conversations is to stand in their standpoint. My job, when they critique me, is to ask them three or four or five times in different ways, tell me more about your point of view. What am I missing here? And I may not fully agree with their point of view and I may not accept it, but by asking those questions, I'm showing them respect. And in any conversation, respect is like air. If it's present, no one notices. If it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. And so I just need to show respect. Um, you know, in, in any conversation, uh, there, are, there are two conversations. There's the nominal subject we're talking about, but then the more important part of the conversation is the emotional flow between us as we talk. With everything I say, with everything you say, we're either making each other feel more safe or less safe, more respected or less respected. So when I'm having a conversation, I need to pay attention not only to what we're nominally talking about, but to the emotional volleys between us. And there's gonna be a time when we're gonna disagree and when we're gonna get angry at each other. And when we get angry at each other, our motivations will deteriorate. We won't be talking about what do we think about the Middle East. We'll be like, you're evil, I'm good. And er once our emotional det emotions deteriorate, our motivations deteriorate, everything we say to each other will destroy our relationship. I talked to a guy, I mentioned this theory to a guy who had a divorce. He said that was our problem. When our, emo when our motivations started deteriorating with my wife, we kept talking. And we said so many hurtful things to each other, we couldn't repair the relationship. So once your motivations start deteriorating, the right thing to do is not just to keep going, it's to stop and say, how did we get here? And then it's to do a thing which the psychologists called splitting, which we say, here's what I intended to say. I did not mean to silence you. I meant to try to understand you. So it's first to say, here's what I did not try to do, and then to split and say, here's what I did try to do. And that way you're pausing the cycle of your, relation, of your conversation and you're pulling back and you're saying, let's start over. And that's the good way to repair a relationship. And so these are just skills, conversational skills. Getting to know someone, getting to know someone in depression, getting to know someone across disagreement. And there's a stage from a, there's a phrase from a philosopher I like, Parker Palmer, Every epistemology becomes an ethic. The shape of our knowledge becomes the shape of our living. The relationship of the knower to the known becomes the relationship of the living self to the larger world. What he's saying is the way we attend to others, the way we pay attention to others, becomes our way of being in the larger world. It becomes our morality. The quality of attention you bring to the world becomes your way of being in the world and it becomes your way of sharing the world with others. If you look at the world with judgmental eyes, you will find flaws in everybody. If you look at the world with fearful eyes, you will find threat from everybody. But if you look at the world with generous eyes, you'll see people doing the best they can. And so the quality of the eyes you bring to every encounter is part of how you show up in the world. Iris Murdoch, a novelist and philosopher I admire, said that Seeing others is the essential moral act. Usually we see others with self-centered eyes. But if we can see each other with a just and loving attention, then we will become better people and we'll have better relationships, a just and loving attention. So I ask people, tell me about a time you feel seen. And with glowing eyes, they tell me about moments when they, somebody really got them. Um, uh, there was a woman who, runs a homeless shelter, and she, in early COVID, she was just swamped and overwhelmed. And she came home weeping, and she hugged her dog, and her husband sat down next to her and said, here are the six chores I'm gonna do while you're slammed at work. She said, I felt seen at that moment. It wasn't a big dramatic moment. He just got her. 
I met a woman in her 30s, and I said, tell me about a time you felt seen. And she said, well, when I was 13, I had my first taste of alcohol. I got so drunk, I couldn't move. I was on the porch of her house, and I couldn't get up. And my dad, who was a strict disciplinarian, I thought he came out on the porch. I thought he was going to scream at me the things I was already thinking in my head, which was, I'm bad, I'm bad. And instead, he just scooped her up in his arms. He carried her inside. And he laid her on the sofa. And he said, there'll be no punishment here. You've had an experience. And he understood that she did not need to be talked to at that moment. And 25 years later, she remembered that. I have a friend here in DC who said his daughter was um, in second grade and she was struggling. And the teacher said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that one comment turned the girl's ear around because the thing she thought was a weakness, her social awkwardness, turned into a strength. She's good at thinking before she speaks. And when he told me that story, I thought of my own 11th grade English teacher, Mrs. Dustat. And I was giving some smart ass comment in class. And she said to me, David, you're trying to get by on glibness, stop it. And I thought, wow, I'm humiliated. And then I thought, wow, she really knows me. I'm so honored. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a moment of being seen. And so there are times when people just see you well. There was a, a moment in the 1930s, um, Franklin Roosevelt was in the White House, and a 28-year-old congressman came into the White House and um, said to him, and they had a visit, a 30-minute meeting, and then after this 28-year-old congressman named Lyndon Johnson left, FDR said to his aide, Harold Ickes, Ickes, you know, Harold, that's the kind of uninhabited young pro I might have been as a young man if I hadn't gone to Harvard. <laughs> and then he said, in the next couple of generations, the balance of power in this country is going to shift to the South and West. And that kid, Lyndon Johnson, may become their first Southwestern president. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, there are some moments that are transcendently beautiful of seeing. And so I read a, a book by a writer named Catherine Schultz, a book called Lost and Found, uh, recently a memoir that came out a year or two ago. And she wrote about her dad, uh, Isaac. And Isaac was apparently one of these gregarious, wonderful guys who had talked to Mean Streak. He had opinions on everything from the infield fly rule in baseball to whether apple crisp are better than apple cobbler. Uh, and at the end of his life, he, he uh, went silent. He was dying and suddenly he just stopped talking and nobody could figure it out. And she wrote, I always, had always regarded my family as close, so it was startling to realize how much closer we could get, how near we drew to his waning flame. And so one night toward the very end, when he was really quiet, they went around the room and they each wanted to say the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. And so Schultz describes the moment. My father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to the next as we spoke, his brown eyes shining with tears. I had always hated to see him cry and seldom did, but for once I was grateful. It gave me hope that for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, I knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he'd always been, with this family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. So that was a guy who died completely well seen. And so people describe to these moments when they see, are seen with such golden reverence. And I can tell you, it's also good to be the one who's doing the seeing. And so we have a place on Capitol Hill. And one night, one day, afternoon, about two and a half years ago, um, I was at our dining room table reading a boring book, which is what I'm paid to do. And I was looked up and my wife came in the front door, which you can see from our dining room. And the door opened and it was summertime and she paused in the doorway and the summer sun came in from behind her. 
and sort of illuminated her from behind. And she didn't notice I was there, because that's the kind of charisma I have. <laughs> uh, uh, and she looked at an orchid, which we keep on a table by the front door. And I had this sensation moving across my mind. And the sensation was, I really know her. I know her through and through. And if you had asked me what I knew about her at that moment, it was not her personality traits, it was not the words I would use to describe her. It was the wholeness of her being, it was the ebb and flow, the harmony of her music, just her way of being in the world. It was almost as if I wasn't seeing her, I was seeing out from her. And to, see, to know somebody really well, you have to know how they see the world. And so it was just this golden moment of thinking, wow, I really know this person. And if you had asked me to describe a word, I was to describe how I was looking at her, the only word in the English language I can think of is the word beholding. I was just beholding her. I was just looking at her with appreciation and respect. And it was a great moment. And I told this story recently to some older couple and they said, that's what we do with our grandkids. We just behold them. And it's, it's just like, that's a moment of human connection. So we're living um, in a brutal age. You look at the famous dates of our century, September 11th, January 6th, October 7th. These are just brutal dates. And it's so easy in our culture and in our century and our times to become dehumanized, to become toughened, to become thickened, to develop a tough authoritarian mindset. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We can't afford morality. We can't afford vulnerability. It's just eat or be eaten. And I live in this world. I was on Twitter maybe a week ago two weeks ago, and I'm doom scrolling through all these images from the Middle East. And I was, I was scrolling, I saw an image of an interview that James Baldwin had given in the 1960s. And he, he, he was giving an interview and he said, there may not be as much humanity in the world as you would want, but there's some, there's more than you would think. And he said, walk down the street of any city any afternoon and look around you. What you've got to remember is you were looking the people you are looking at are you. Everyone you're looking at could be you. You could be that person, you could be that monster. And your choice is to decide not to be. And so I'm looking at all these Middle Eastern images and I see James Baldwin and I think, well, there's defiant humanism. James Baldwin lived with a lot of toughness, a lot of racism, a lot of bigotry, but he did not give up the act of being a human being, of being a defiant humanist. He was going to do the defiant humanist thing, which is try to understand other people, try to understand himself, and try to cast a just and loving attention on others. And it seems to me that's what we're called to do in these tough times, is not to give up on the fact of vulnerability, of humanism, of seeing. And people think it's woo-woo and naive, but I would say it's not naive to lead with respect. It's not naive to lead with curiosity. It's not naive to think, I want to get to know you. It's the only practical way of getting out of the spiral we're in. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have, I think, some time for Q&A. We have two microphones here, and in good sixth and I tradition, all that I ask is you ask long, rambling questions with no question at the end. <laughs> Let's start right here. Hi, thanks so much. And first of all, it's cobbler, not crisp, right? Yeah, anyhow, um, my mother is 94 years old and I really can't have a relationship with her anymore due to her progressive Alzheimer's. How would you advise somebody like me in that situation wow. to make her feel seen? Wow, 
that's a good, very good question. I guess I'm not an expert at that. I, um, I was, last night I was in Philadelphia and I met a couple and we were talking and she had Alzheimer's and he didn't. And he said, she's not gonna remember this. And she said, yes I will. <laughs> and I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert about being around people who suffered from this. But I just decided I was going to, I didn't want to adjudicate this dispute of what she would remember, but this moment was going to matter. And so I, I tried to be there for that moment. Um, and so I, I'm not sure I have a, a great answer to give you, except for that the, the idea that human life and the quality of human life does not diminish with the diminishment of some capacities. And so I, I'm a firm believer that Every human being is of infinite value and dignity. And that includes somebody with Alzheimer's, that just includes anybody with any other condition. Uh, and so I, I wish I could give you a great answer to feel, so she would feel known by you. But each moment matters and how you treat them will, will be, uh, I guess, important to you in the years ahead. I, I don't know if I'm capturing your experience, I'm really just guessing here. But I hope, uh, tell, me, tell me about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's the sort of thing like she wouldn't even be able to answer something like your friend's wife said, I, oh yes, I'll remember. I mean, she's not really there. Yeah. So, maybe yes. just, yeah. Yeah, I, I knew a guy who worked in democratic administrations in the city and his final two words, he had Alzheimer's, were uh, bureaucratic level and democratic party. <laughs> Those are the final two words he had. It was very poignant. Um, <laughs> But in my, in my, this is just my belief, she's as much a human being as she ever was. And our, the quality of our life is not measured by certain mental capacities. It's mental, measured by being a human being. So I don't, that's not helpful to you, but it's all I No, it is. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm curious any tips you would have on, aside from giving people a copy of your book, <laughs> on the following scenario. So let's say you hypothetically have people in your life who understand at a very surface level, um, very surface level idea of the merit of getting to know somebody else. But, and they like the idea of that, but it hasn't really translated into asking questions with an air of compassionate curiosity, and there's kind of a disconnect between like their expressed desire and what you see playing out in practice. How would you even begin to introduce yeah. this concept, and if they are being genuine in their desire to improve on these skills, take the first step. I think it might be like a little bit of an argument to convince them of the merit of doing the work and then, yeah. you know, kind of beginning the journey. Yeah. So welcome to the first 50 years of my life. <laughs> um, Thank you. And so I guess I would say, um, you know, I had this dualism, illuminators and diminishers. And what can you do if somebody's a total diminisher? Let's say they're Let, let's innocuous. Say that well intentioned but unskilled. Yes. So I guess that really is the first 50 years of my life. And I would say the, the right thing to do in those circumstances is to open a, a little door. And so the first door you can open is the door of childhood. Then you can ask them, you can open with a little curiosity. Who were you in high school and how have you changed? And that's like an accessible way to get them to talk a little about their life. And then the, you can open the door of vulnerability. I'm not sure about this with myself. And in each case, you've opened a door and they may slam the door shut on you. And if my 40-year-old self, I might have. I might have said, that's very fascinating, but I have to go to the dry cleaner right now. Um, and because I just was fearful of that kind of connection because I don't know what to say. But on the other hand, if you've opened the door, you give them a chance to like walk a little through the door and the only thing I can say is it requires a lot of patience for people like that. There's a D.H. Lawrence quote I have put somewhere in the book. As you approach somebody like that, your approach, it's like approaching a fawn or a deer in the forest. You approach gently, without willfulness, without aggressiveness, 
or they will run away. So you don't yell, ask me questions. <laughs> you know, no, I, <laughs> now, what you should do is you go, you son of a bitch, ask me a question. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I, I think it's just that gradual, but I've learned and I, you can't force people to be more vulnerable than they want to be. And so people are at their stage they're at. Uh, and so it's those little doorways you can open. That's the only thing I can say. So thank you for the question. We have just a few minutes to take these last three questions. Okay. So we keep hearing about self-awareness. And when I listen to you, I feel like I'm listening to somebody who's very aware. When would you say you came upon a level of awareness? Hmm. If my wife's in the room, she could probably answer this question better than I can. But um, I must say, I, I find self-introspection to be very weak. I, and the psychologists back me up on this, that when we think to look within ourselves to find out who we are, uh, we do t one of two things. One, we settle for the easy insight. Oh, here's who I am, it makes me feel good, let me settle for that inner insight. Or else we ruminate and we spiral down uh, and don't come up with great insights. I find self-awareness is really something you do in a community. When people have the courage to tell you who you really are and you process. And so there, in the section of the book, I didn't do this in my talk, but there's a, a speech, a great speech from the movie Goodwill Hunting. And if you remember that movie, there's a Matt Damon character who's a math whiz and there's a therapist who's Robin Williams. And Robin Williams says to him, he gets eviscerated by the Matt Damon character and he pulls him out to a pond and he says to him, I don't see a confident man, I see a scared shitless kid. And he gives him a little speech. And that speech the Robin Williams character gives him flows from great listening because he's taken the one thing the Matt Damon character is most terrified to reveal, which is he's scared from his orphan background. And he says, I'm laying that on the table, and I'm, I care for you anyway. And that's what somebody else can do to give you self-awareness. I think it's often the other people who name stuff about ourselves that teach us who we are. We see ourselves as others see us. And then the other part of that speech is he takes, he says there are two kinds of knowledge. There's the book knowledge, which you have, but then there's the personal knowledge that comes from experience and things that comes from being vulnerable, that comes from really living, and you don't have that. And so he, it's critiquing with care. He's telling him, here's what you need. And so that beautiful speech, and when you look at the movie, you go on YouTube, I've watched it like 8,000 times. The Matt Damon character knows that the Robin Williams character is telling him the truth. And so I, I think it's hard to have real self-awareness without other people who love you telling you the truth from a position of unconditional regard. So, thank you. Maybe we'll, I'll, I'll give shorter answers when we'll speed through these. <laughs> um, thanks so much for, um, for the book and for the event. My question is um, about the ability to see others and be deeply seen in our national leaders. You have written many columns about President Biden and how he has been very good at this, but I was wondering who else currently in our national leadership would you say is good at this skill? And if you have any particular stories, that would yeah. be interesting too. Right. Obviously, Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I find politicians are, um, I have, we've all met a bunch of them. I, I mean, the, Bill Clinton had the skill to make you feel like you're the only one in the universe to him. I mentioned that treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. Clinton was good at that. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the others. I'm thinking of the members of Congress right now who I felt uh, like are super high in emotional intelligence. Drawing a bit of a blank. <laughs> um, and in part because they're in broadcast mode all the time. They're like, talk, talk, talk. They're not in receive, receive, receive. And I have noticed with presidents, especially even Barack Obama, who was more back and forth and dating by the end of his eight years, he was in broadcast mode. And so I just think it's a part of the corruption of the business that they're in. And I think Trump, uh, Biden has um, way above average of the people I've covered. I mentioned my friend Pete who died. 
And somehow, the day after Pete died, Biden heard about it through the grapevine. And out of the blue, he calls me, uh, and he's wonderful. And he just said, tell me about Pete. And it was, it was just a, a beautiful moment. Uh, from, and he earned that from his own suffering. Uh, and so I, I, I try to think of others who are capable of that. But it, I come up short. And I have to say, I, I admire most of the politicians I meet. I, I find they're good people caught in a terrible circumstance. And I don't agree with AOC a lot. But I happened to be seated next to her at a dinner recently, and I found her completely charming and wonderful. And we, we spent with a bunch of young freshmen in the house or junior members of the house 45 minutes talking about how to grind coffee. <laughs> I, thought, I told them, this is the most millennial conversation I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. OK. We'll do just this one more. Or... So in your stories, that you told for the, the decline of the, of the social skills mm -hmm. that we have. One thing I didn't hear was religion mm -hmm. and the decline of religious institutions. And it seems to me that when they work well, then all of those social skills work well. And I'm thinking particularly of the last month in Rome with the Catholic Church and the Synod, which seems to be a very good example of what you're talking about yeah. here. Yeah, so in the Bible, the Bible's very profound and very wise about this. So in our culture, modern Western culture, we make this big distinction between reason and emotion. And we think reason is really trustworthy, emotion is really untrustworthy. The Bible did not make this distinction. And modern neuroscience does not make this distinction. There's no distinction between reason and emotion. And so in the Bible, to know is to, it's to study someone but it's also to have sex with someone, to enter into covenant with someone. And so it's a full, the to know is an emotional, spiritual, and intellectual experience all at once. And so religion offers that to people. And it offers that, as I mentioned with Jimmy Durrell, the idea that each person is made in the image of God and is worthy of that kind of respect. And then in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, it's filled with dramas of recognition where characters are called upon to see another person. And often they fail. Isaac and Esau, they fail to recognize the right son. In the New Testament, the disciples don't recognize the risen Christ. Uh, and then uh, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's an injured guy on the side of the road and a bunch of Levites walk by him and they don't see him. They see him intellectually, but they don't see him enough to care for him. Only the Samaritan, a member of a hated tribe, actually sees him. And so that level of seeing, I think, is constantly reinforced in the biblical wisdom of both Jews, Muslims, and Arabs, or in Muslim, uh, and Christians. Uh, and so it, the Bible is way ahead of us. And sometimes I think the decline of biblical knowledge and its replacement with hyper-rational scientific Western knowledge has been a problem. And then the final thing I'll say is that religious institutions, I mentioned these are skills. And so institutions embody certain skills and pass on certain skills in across generations. So if your spouse dies, the normal advice you to give is not, well, you should go to a party for the next week. But in the Jewish tradition, sitting Shiva for a week is what you do. And sitting Shiva is a set of institutions where you come to somebody's house, the person who's grieving has to prepare a lot of hors d'oeuvres, so they got something to do with their day. And then somebody comes to them and they're instructed to sit there with them and they can talk about the deceased or not talk about the deceased. It's gonna be up to the grieving person. And so within the Shiva tradition, there's all sorts of embedded human wisdom about how you help somebody walk through grief. And if you're in a synagogue or in a religious congregation of any sort, when somebody dies, people know what to do. But if you're spiritual and not religious, and you're not in any institution, when somebody dies, 
You may have friends, but there's no set of structures and rituals about what to do. And so that's a social loss. And so uh, I do think not only their, the theology, not only the faith, but the actual structures of community are part of the networks that weave us together. And the loss of those communities has been hard for us. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my final advertisement for you is to join Six and I. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much to David Brooks. That was beautiful. And thank you all for joining us.